Hey everyone, it's Tuesday, it's three o'clock. And what does that mean? That means it's Tech Tuesday. So today I'm gonna to be looking at a survey that Del Oro Group did of 50 cable operators. And we're gonna be looking at um, basically what some of these cable operators are thinking as far as their future as it pertains to virtual CMTS and uh, flexible Mac architecture, some of those more advanced services to be able to improve their network and compete with fiber operators. Be right back. And thanks for joining me again. This is Rick Uzi with Z Quorum. So uh, I saw this come out uh, again. This is Deloro Group, um, an analyst group. I saw this come out in November of last year, and I've been wanting to uh, just talk through it a little bit. I'm, you know, it's a pretty long report. I just wanted to show some highlights, and I wanted to make you aware that it was available uh, because this is a, you don't need to pay for this. This is a, something available just if you go to their website. In fact, I've got it linked in the description of this video. If you go down there, you'll see where you can download this. So. Again, mapping the future of cable virtualization. Uh, this is from Jeff Hainan at uh, VP of Broadband Access and Home Networking Research for Del Oro Group. Um, so you see there's an executive summary, uh, table of contents, some of the things that are in here. So I wanted to just cherry pick a few things just as I talk through this, uh, but obviously you can, you can download and read through this. Uh, so you see here, introduction, most cable operators have experienced a dramatic shift in the competitive landscape in just the last year, and certainly we've seen that. Uh, both from fiber and also fixed wireless uh, 5G services. In general, cable operators successfully navigated the COVID-19 pandemic by means of an aggressive mix of node splitting, service group size reduction, and upstream and downstream bandwidth increases. And that's true, that uh, cable operators were very capable uh, in the way that they could approach that. So even though they, they normally don't have nearly as much upstream uh, bandwidth, for example, they still were able to weather that. And if they did have some constraint issues there, they were able to do things like node splits to, to improve that. So uh, unlike, let's say, a DSL operator that was already having uh, issues with the kind of bandwidth that was available to their consumers, um, cable operators were already pretty well set. Most of them had upgraded to, to do certainly DOCSIS 3, and, and a lot of them uh, DOCSIS 3.1 to be able to uh, meet the demands that were kind of newly thrust on them from the pandemic. Says, however, they, they now face a problem of the concerted and well-funded overbuilding efforts of fiber operators, uh, and that is something they need to be concerned about. Now, overbuilding, as far as getting federal funds to do that, they shouldn't have to worry about that if they're already providing services over the standard definition of broadband of 25 by 3 and, let's say, underserved 100 by 20. So unserved, anything less than 25 by 3, underserved, anything less than 100 by 20. Most cable operators are easily able to provide uh, a, pa a plan or a package that exceeds that. So that shouldn't be an issue. But if there is a, a fiber operator that wants to encroach on their territory uh, and self-fund that, that's certainly something that they need to worry about. And again, also, they've got uh, fixed wireless operators like T-Mobile and Verizon that are coming in that are providing mid-band spectrum that can provide pretty good speeds, uh, but they're also offering very aggressive pricing. So uh, cable operators have seen some churn related to that. They're also seeing their own churn rates increase as subscribers increasingly value increased upstream bandwidth to support ongoing video conferencing, gaming, and other low latency application requirements. So on the upstream, um, they're pretty well, uh, there's not really any issues with, again, a cable operator can have a, a plan certainly that can provide the kind of upstream bandwidth that someone would need to do uh, video conferencing, those kinds of things. It's not as easy as a fiber operator who can much more easily do symmetrical upstream, downstream kind of packages, one gig, very easy for them to do. Well, I should say very easy, but uh, compared to ca cable, uh, it's a little bit easier to do a one gig package. Uh, but even that's not needed for most applications for home users. And then you've got low latency. Certainly fi fiber is going to be lower latency than cable, but there are some low latency DOCSIS options uh, coming with uh, DOCSIS 4.0 that cable operators can look at. Cable operators continue to modernize their networks to push fiber deeper, reduce MERs or modulation error rates, that's similar to signal to noise ratio, and reduce the overall cost of operating their broadband access and outside plant networks. So, um, and that is a big part of how cable operators are competing with fiber is by, by if you can't beat them, join them. <laughs> so they're putting more fiber in their network. Uh, they still uh, are trying to avoid having to completely do a rip and replace because the the most 
expensive part of that is going to be the last mile. So they can go ahead and extend their fiber out to get it as, to the edge as close as they can to the subscriber. But then you've got that coax plant that, uh, you know, to try to get rid of all of that and then upgrade how you do things as far as provisioning and um, other kinds of things uh, can be difficult if you're going to go all straight fiber to the to the home. Uh, so that's something that they're considering. But it does say um, in the near term, cable operators will push forward with a number of key strategic initiatives through 2026. Uh, quickly improving upstream capacity through mid-split and high-split upgrades, resulting in positive YY increases in upstream channel license purchases through 2026, year to year, I guess. Um, replacing legacy optical nodes that have reached, reached maximum segmentation with DAA nodes as distributed access architecture, including remote PHY and remote MAC PHY devices. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about more, more about what that is here in, in a bit. Uh, replacing aging amplifiers, taps, and other passives to begin the process of preparing networks for DOCSIS 4.0. So they're going to need to replace these to get uh, the those kinds of actives and passives that support uh, the DOCSIS 4.0 uh, technology. Marketing to virtual market, or excuse me, migrating to virtualized CMTS platforms for remote FI deployments and to cap and grow traditional centralized CCAP platforms. So again, there's a lot of this uh, survey was about virtual CMTS, as we'll see here in a minute. And I was going to show real quickly, it's talking about mid splits and high splits. So that's something that cable operators are doing again to kind of in, to increase the amount of bandwidth that they can provide to their customers, especially on the upstream, because again, that's where it's not been an issue in the past. Um, it's become more prevalent as people are doing what I'm doing right now, which would be streaming or participating in Zooming, Zoom calls or got other things that are going to be using upstream bandwidth. If you've got security cameras, those kinds of things. Uh, you had more people at home during the pandemic doing those things. So you had parents doing Zoom work, kids doing Zoom school. So there was that situation. So the upstream became constrained and mid splits and high splits were, were, uh, was what they were doing to try to mitigate that. Now I was going to go ahead and show just what that is. Um, let's see if I can get in here and get that smaller. There we go. So uh, so if you're looking at the upstream splits that cable operators are doing, so your, your traditional split, which they call a subsplit now, I don't know if it's always been called that, um, probably subsplit now that these, we've got these others. So this is kind of traditionally what most cable operators have been doing, and that's going up to 42 megahertz on the upstream. And then f for the downstream, they start at 54, go up to 860. This is kind of your, uh, ex kind of an exclusion band here for where the diaplex filter is. You don't want to put anything there because that can cause roll off. So you've got your upstream uh, bandwidth, you've got your downstream bandwidth here. And then the mid splits, they're increasing that uh, by going up to 85 megahertz on the upstream. So this gives them a lot more capacity on the upstream. And then that also increases the downstream up to 750 gigahertz or one gigahertz on the downstream. And then the high splits uh, that some are looking at uh, significantly increases the upstream, as you can see here from five up to 204 megahertz. And then again, you've got this band that's going to be a little bit wider here to, uh, for the diplex filters. And then again, you've got your downstream up to one or 1.2 gigahertz. I think maybe uh, it might be up to 1.8 uh, on some future configurations with DOCSIS 4.0. Uh, if I'm remember, I might be remembering that wrong. I don't know, but that's uh, basically what your splits are in the in the cable plant. Um, so we've got here. I'll just read through a little bit of this. So each of these upgrades is being deployed to prepare DOCSIS, net, DOCSIS networks for a transition to DOCSIS 4 by the end of this decade. And many of the initiatives listed above will be completed by extending and improving current DOCSIS 3.1 implementations. And that's true because some operators are just basically uh, sticking with 3.1, but doing what they can. They can still do these high splits in DOCSIS 3.1. They can still do uh, distributed access architecture. I think flexible Mac, Mac architecture. So DOCSIS 4.0 is not required, uh, but that's going to help them. DOCSIS 4.0 is going to help them get closer to that uh, that one gig uh, symmetrical kind of service that everybody's looking for, or even higher. Uh, so that's that's kind of the goal. But a lot of them are looking at maybe not even doing DOCSIS 4.0, but getting the most they can out of DOCSIS 3.1. Because one of the one of the decisions the cable operator has to make is, do I put a lot of money into this DOCSIS 4.0 stuff, or do I just say, you know what, I'm just going to upgrade what I can right now, and then over time, I'm going to just overbuild myself with fiber, just go fiber to the home. Because again, they're extending fiber all the way out, and as they do these 
distributed access architecture kinds of deployments. They're uh, basically going most of the way that they need to go with digital um, signal out to, in the plant. So the decision is, do I just bite the bullet and start overbuilding or upgrading or migrating over to fiber? So that's what people are looking at right now, these cable operators. And some are going to be stri stick, sticking strictly cable for a long time. Others are already through the process of, of doing that, of saying, you know, I'm going to go ahead and start upgrading fiber plant where I need it most, upgrading to fiber. Accomplishing these initiatives is the fastest way for cable operators to improve their competitive positioning relative to fiber, fiber overbuilders while simultaneously achieving the incremental steps for the ultimate transition to either full duplex DOCSIS, FDX, or 1.2 gigahertz or extended spectrum DOCSIS at 1.8 gigahertz. So uh, that's kind of the two paths on DOCSIS 4.0. There's full duplex DOCSIS, which is transmitting the signal in both directions over the same path um, and then making a symmetrical kind of service where you've got the same upstream and downstream or extending the spectrum up to 1.8 gigahertz. And again, that's, what, that's, that's using the same kind of spectrum allocation that they have now where you've got the split spectrum. So you've got some, as we saw in that uh, image, we've got some upstream spectrum in one part of, part of the spectrum, um, upstream traffic in one part of the spectrum. Then we've got downstream spec spectrum in the other part. So that's the extended spectrum doxis where you're extending the amount of spectrum that you can use, but you're not doing the full duplex. So those are kind of the two choices. Comcast is, uh, they're kind of on the full duplex uh, path. Uh, they're the only one I think that's really committed to that. A lot of the others are looking at maybe doing extended spectrum doxis as the way that they increase the amount of bandwidth that they can use uh, and provide. Throughout this extended upgrade cycle, virtual CMTS, or VCMTS platforms will serve a key function, namely giving operators the flexibility to choose their approach and determine which part of the outside plant will be impacted in a given upgrade wave. When the new capacity is required, whether downstream or upstream, new VCT VCMTS servers can be quickly added in any location and or existing software resources can be reallocated to any service groups that are undergoing capacity upgrades. In many cases, these resources can be added much more quickly with a VCMTS platform than with a centralized CCAP platform, which the latter would require at least a line card upgrade to support increased capacity. So what they're talking about here, um, traditionally cable operators have had what's, what's called the CMTS in the head end. Um, so it was a big, some people call it big iron. So you'd have this big CMTS in a centralized hub head end that would then feed out uh, the HFC plant out to subscribers. So everybody's connecting to the same CMTS. Um, so there are changes that are taking place. Um, there's what we'll hear about here in a bit. Again, distributed access architecture or flexible Mac architecture where they're distributing some of the functions of a CMTS out into the field. In some cases, the whole CMTS out into the field. But then there's also virtual CMTS where um, it's, it's not even a, a piece of CMTS hardware. It's basically it's network functions virtualization where you are taking a piece of equipment like a CMTS and instead of running it on this proprietary equipment, you're running it on standard kind of x86 uh, hardware, like a computer basically, and you're just basically putting software on there that does the functionality, and then you're virtualizing that. So uh, that's what they're talking about there. So that is kind of a trend that we're seeing is this VCMTS as opposed to proprietary CMTS hardware that would normally deliver the cable service to customers, cable modem service and video service, actually. Uh, so here we see maturity of the solutions. Uh, this is why we've seen DAA platforms increase in 2021 due to a number of important factors. So this is distributed access architecture. And there are two types of that. There is something called remote phi, which takes the uh, physical layer out of the CMTS, uh, kind of your con connections. <laughs> and that, that goes out in the field, but you leave the the Mac portion um, of the CMTS in the head end or in a centralized location. So that was kind of the first wave that we saw with this distributed access architecture. Again, that's trying to push things further out closer to the customer. And then you've got remote MacFi, and that's taking the whole thing basically. That's kind of, if you think about it, it's like a little small CMTS that you're going to put out. So rather than having that big centralized CMTS in a head end, you've got, uh, you could still have a head end, but you still could have smaller CMTSs out in the field that are, again, pushing that service closer to the customer. So that could be in a hardened cabinet somewhere out in the field as opposed to sitting in a, in a head-end room. Um, so 
one of the concerns was maturity of the solutions, uh, concerns regarding the maturity of the proposed solutions and interoperability between virtual CCAP and CCAP core vendors and RPD suppliers. RPD, that's a re remote FI device. So that would be the physical part of remote FI that goes out in the field that connects stuff up. Um, so there was concern that, you know, if you had different vendors that they wouldn't play nice together. But I, I think most of that now is is not an issue. I think they do, they are compatible and, and work together. Uh, upstream relief as a, as a driver, as we were talking about, in the immediate aftermath of COVID lockdowns, cable operators saw an incredible jump in the demand for upstream bandwidth, which forced them to respond with software tweaks to their DOCSIS 3.1 services. They also saw a significant jump in node splits, as I mentioned, to reduce service group sizes and increase upstream bandwidth. So re again, that's one reason you do node splits in addition to you know, you do these mid and high splits, you've got node splits where you're trying to get fewer customers on a node uh, so that you've got um, fewer customers using that bandwidth. You can provide each one more bandwidth. These trends t continue today, mid and high split architectures, which provide significant increases in upstream bandwidth, as I showed you that image, and then doing so in conjunction with upgrading to remote PHY or remote MAC PHY to capitalize on it, the additional signal improvements. So again, as you push portions of the CMTS or the whole CMTS, uh, out further into the field, closer to the customer, you get better signal improvements. Uh, it's fiber further out, it's digital further out. And so you don't have as many RF issues that you have to troubleshoot and that can cause uh, you know issues with performance, those kinds of things. So all of these things are helping cable operators compete with fiber operators. Second generation chips, uh, the second generation chips that have been integrated in RPDs and RMDs reduce heat dissipation to acceptable levels for all operators. So it used to be that there were some heat dissipation issues, uh, especially on the I think on the especially on the remote Mac Phi equipment that was out there. You know, it's out in the field and in a hardened enclosure and got temperatures to con be, be contending with. So those were some issues that were I think some of those again have been mitigated. Uh, DOCSIS 4.0 consensus. So again, there are these. There were two ways that it looked like DOCSIS 4.0 was going to go. You know, are you going to do full duplex? Are you going to do extended spectrum DOCSIS? And they went ahead and put both of those in DOCSIS 4.0 standards. So that freed up cable operators to start uh, making decisions. So you've got extended spectrum DOCSIS, as I mentioned, and full duplex DOCSIS FDX. Uh, now there, now there is consensus that both paths will rely heavily on DAA technologies, the distributed access technologies. However, it will be several years before DOCSIS 4.0 has a significant impact on DAA deployments. We expect operators to begin replacing their taps throughout this year, amplifiers beginning next year, and then nodes beginning in late 2023 and 2024. So when it says this year, this is late 2022. So again, you see uh, nodes, nodes beginning in late 2023 and 2024. So... Um, Again, the, you know, if you're looking at DOCSIS 4.0, you've got some additional upgrades you need to do out in the field. Whereas with just DOCSIS 3.1, you can do the distributed access architecture, remote FI, remote MAC FI using, you don't need to do those kinds of upgrades. So that's something else that uh, operators need to take into account. In September 2020, Cable Labs released the specifications for FMA, that's flexible MAC architecture, that defines a disaggregation of the CCAP and virtual CMTS into separate management control and data planes. So um, that's important uh, because you can now kind of centrally manage the network as opposed to uh, you, when you separate the control plane and the data plane. So you can do uh, NFV, you see here, if FMA expands the disaggregation of a traditional integrated CCAP and today's virtual CMTS platforms into a combination of DAA, that's distributed access architecture, SDN, that's software defined networking, and NFV, that's network functions virtualization. So um, really it's the SDN part, I guess, that's gonna separate your control and data planes. So um, that would be similar to, NFV is similar to VMware, if you're familiar with that, where you can take a, um, what would normally be a proprietary server you might have in a data center lots of different servers. Well, with and with uh, network functions virtualization, you can put that stuff on what's called a hypervisor, and you virtualize everything. So you can have lots of stuff running. Uh, you don't need to have separate servers. And in the case of a uh, CMTS, you can virtualize that CMTS and put all of the functions that would normally be on a piece of proprietary hardware and put that in a virtual environment as well. Uh, more importantly, 
Flexible Mac architecture gives cable operators the flexibility they need as they navigate how to prioritize current capacity upgrades through traditional node splits, mid and high splits, upcoming outside plan upgrades to 1.2 gigahertz and 1.8 gigahertz, and the determination of whether their future access network will rely on DOCSIS 4.0, Fiber to the home or a combination of the two. FMA gives cable operators the flexibility to deliver low latency DOCSIS and mobile X haul over DOCSIS. That would be mobile back haul, mobile front haul, whatever they need to do in the network. So uh, for DAA specifically, FMA gives operators a blueprint for pursuing access networks that incorporate multiple physical layer technologies from remote PHY to remote MAC PHY, fiber to the premise, and even fixed wireless. So that's a big change too. So now uh, including now they've got these standardized, um, uh, can't think of the word, but uh, the enclosures that go out there that, again, those used to be specific for something like it might be specifically, specifically for fiber or specifically for cable, but now you can get those and put little components in there so you can decide as you, as you put your infrastructure out there, well, this is going to be, I'm going to be, living, be delivering fiber to the premise out here, so you put out that kind of a enclosure, or you could put out one of these uh, enclosures that you can put the modules in and you can kind of swap them in and out. But what Fle Flexible Mac architecture does is now a cable operator, as they're expanding in different areas or upgrading in different areas, they have lots of um, flexibility. There you go, lots of flexibility, Flexible Mac architecture to be able to decide what they want to do, how they want to do it. Finally, FMA opens the door to the true virtualization of cable access networks, supporting any number of use cases and any number of physical layer connections through the same disaggregated network functions, which can be placed in any physical location, node, hub site, head end, super head end, or data center. So um, now their network can really be very centralized. It could be sitting in an Amazon uh, cloud somewhere. Uh, and that's, that is kind of the direction that a lot of operators are moving so that they can centrally manage everything through this um, software-defined networking that is capable now through this new technology. Uh, let's see what else we had here. So uh, this was just showing who participated in this. So you've got a lot of a lot of higher level folks. So folks that uh, primarily decision maker, 22%, a lot of influence, 50%, some influence, 28%. So you can see your job titles, C-level executives, 12%, vice presidents, 30%, directors, 58% that answered this survey. Um, I'm going to skip that. Uh, respondents con continuing to reduce service group sizes. So again, this was something that cable operators have been doing to try to get uh, better speeds and performance for their subscribers. And again, they were looking at doing this. This was a big part of what they were doing during the pandemic. Uh, the majority of respondents, 42%, said they averaged between 500 and 749 homes per service group today, followed by 34% averaging service group sizes anywhere from 750 to 999. 16% of respondents averaged between 250 to 499 homes, which is becoming more typical in the North American market. So they're trying to reduce the number of people in these service groups. Uh, you can see here, this is what they're showing here. This little round circle is now, this would be again, the end of 2022. And then by 2025, what they're expecting. So now you've got You've got some that, not many that are on these higher levels, but you do have some here, again, 1,000 to 1,500 roughly, 750 to 1,000 roughly, that that's where they are today, but they're looking at uh, that coming down and more people are getting kind of in this range here. So you see these folks that are here now are gonna be, this is gonna be fewer and fewer operators that are in these kinds of service groups. And more operators are gonna be getting in these smaller service groups here, even a percentage are gonna be 25 to, 100 or so on their service group count. Um, more bandwidth, a driver for reducing service group sizes. Yes, uh, we wanted to know what any changes should mean in terms of downstream bandwidth from the network to the subscriber. The downstream bandwidth is the advertised speed that customers generally consider when deciding which service provider to use. And that's true. A lot of times they're not looking at the upstream. They're looking at how much am I getting downstream? Because that's what where most of the traffic goes. And that's what they're familiar with. It's, critical, it's a critical number and one that must continue to increase, especially in the face of increasing competition from fiber providers. 34% of respondents provide an average of 301 to 500 megabits per second of downstream bandwidth for the residential service offerings. 28% offer 100 to 300 meg. 20% offer 500 to a gig. 
Today, only 4% of respondents offer more than a gig of downstream bandwidth on average. By 2025, 22% of respondents expect to offer more than a gig of downstream bandwidth, while 44% plan to offer 500 to a gig and 20% plan to offer 300, 300 to 500 roughly. And again, you see that here, just graphically, <clears throat> excuse me, where people are today and where they're heading. So you're going to see, you know, very few people, if any, are going to be doing 20 to 50. Same thing here for 50 to 100. There's going to be, these are going to be more what you're going to be seeing. And even these are going to be reducing. So you've got more people that are going to be offering 500 to a gig and then over a gig here uh, in, by 2025. And by 2025, we expect that most operators will offer a premium service tier of two gigs plus downstream with one gig being the service tier that most subscribers will purchase. So uh, again, this is, they're trying as best they can to keep up with the times and to be able to compete with fiber. Uh, now, over time, uh, I fully expect, I think everybody expects these cable operators to become fiber operators. Uh, they are doing that already. Some are doing that already. They've got a lot of HFC, that's hybrid fiber coax plant that's in the ground, but they're on green uh, green kind of deployments, greenfield deployments. They're going fiber. And then uh, I thought that my phone silenced here. Excuse me, just a moment. Um, so on greenfield deployments, they're going fiber. And then uh, a lot of them are looking at cherry picking areas and, and overbuilding that. So over time, Let's say 30 years, I think you're going to see almost everybody is going to be all fiber or, or certainly close to that. Moving to DAA is becoming a critical tool for improving the overall efficiency and longevity of the HFC plant. Uh, regardless of the pro proposed technology, the primary goal of moving to a distributed access architecture is to move the signal from the head end or hub site from analog to digital. So again, you're going from an analog signal to digital signal, signal which is going to be more uh, robust as well as um, you know, closer to the customer. Historically, the forward path downstream in HFC networks has used analog optics, while the reverse path, the upstream, has used a mix of analog and digital optics. Moving to digital optics becomes part of the equation when cable operators are weighing the costs of segmenting or splitting their node op optical nodes. Excuse me. Uh, most HFC architectures in use today are node plus three to node plus five, meaning that the parent node is followed by anything from three to five trunk amplifiers along with 15 to 25 line extender amplifiers. So uh, that's one of the things that cable operators are doing as they try to get closer to the customers. They're trying to get these amplifiers and uh, splitters and extenders and stuff out of the out of the plant so they can, again, have fewer issues, to have fewer things to maintain and uh, more better signal. As noted earlier, operators are continuing to split their nodes to reduce service groups, group sizes while providing significantly more bandwidth, meaning they're likely to move to node plus one or node plus two architectures. And some are looking at node zero, node plus zero. So they want to go from wherever their hub or head end is out to the customer with nothing really between them, no amplifiers. However, with each new node split comes the added cost of new physical nodes fiber strands, additional optical lasers and receivers in the head end, and more DOCSIS channels at the CCAP. For a growing number of operators, a transition to digital optics and distributed access makes more sense than continuing down the path of node splitting and remaining reliant on analog optics. DAA, which involves placing the, the FIRE MAC and the FI access layer functions into the optical node or shelf unit, can provide the following benefits as compared to traditional node splitting. So again, you've got your two options here of uh, remote Phi, where you're taking the physical layer and putting it out in the field, or remote Mac Phi, where you're taking really kind of like a mini CMTS and putting it out in the field. But these both offer, you see here, lower cost digital optics using Ethernet, um, ability to support longer distance fiber spans, ability to support more wavelengths per span, higher throughput for DOCSIS 3.1 and 4.0 services. And then by distributing either the Phi or physical layer or the Mac and Phi functions and pushing RF modulation further downstream, Cable operators can support higher modulation schemes due to higher SNRs, signal noise ratio, reduce the total cost of the HFC plant by moving to digital transport in the fiber portion, reduce the operational costs of provisioning Ethernet based transport links, more flexibility support, more flexibly support the DOCSIS channels by allocating them based on consumption at the node instead of at the head end. And I, not really mentioned here is just the just the maintenance. Uh, so you know, having 
fewer truck rolls because you have you're gonna have fewer RF issues out in the plant. You're gonna have more robust uh, architecture if you're using fiber as far as you can go. Uh, the global pandemic, which shifted operators' priorities to shoring up their upstream bandwidth on the existing platforms using node splits, put large-scale DAA deployments on hold, or among those operators who remained committed to DAA during the pandemic, slowed the rollout. So operators were already moving in that direction, then the pandemic happened, and they were like, wait a minute, we got to put that on hold, and we've got to do what we can immediately to be able to provide additional bandwidth, especially on the upstream for our customers. That's when they started doing the, the node splits to get smaller service groups, um, and again, maybe doing the, uh, the mid-band mid and the high-band splits. However, we're seeing an increase in spending on DAA platforms of all flavors, and we expect deployments to continue to increase as more operators see the success of large-scale deployments that involve vendor interoperability. So they're expecting DAA to increase. Uh, you see here the number of DAA devices. This would be RPDs or MD, RMDs. So this is a remote PHY device. Again, just the physical layer piece out there. That's a remote MACFI device. That would be the CMTS, little small CMTS out in the field. Uh, so you see the number of those devices that, that are deployed. Uh, so you've got a percentage uh, just under 20%, have 1 to 100. And then you've got 100 to 500, roughly 30%. Uh, 36, 7%, something like that, of 501 to 1,000. Then you've got 1,000 to 5,000, 5,000 to 1, et cetera. So you've got fewer and fewer here, obviously, as these are going to be your larger operators are going to have this many out there anyway. Uh, let's see. Then this question here that they asked, which of the following distributed access architecture technologies do you plan to use in your network by March 2024? So not about a year from now, but again, this was back from November. Uh, so... You've got uh, remote PHY devices, RPDs, so about 70% doing that, and about 54% uh, expecting to do remote MAC PHY. Again, RPDs or remote PHY is kind of where things started out because there was a there was a pretty good, uh, I think, defined DOCSIS standard for that. The standard for remote MAC PHY came out later. So uh, a lot of people were going with what they, taking that interim step of doing the physical piece, the remote PHY device out in the field. There were some thoughts that a remote MACFI would then start to take over. And it, I don't know if people get comfortable with remote FI, maybe they won't make the step to remote MACFI. And if you're virtualizing the CMTS, that's in some centralized location. Maybe that doesn't, maybe that means they don't go that route. But you're, right here, you've got 54% saying remote FI and 70% saying remote, excuse me, remote MACFI and 70% saying remote FI. It says, we were allowed, allowed respondents to select both options because we understood that some operators will use both technologies in the networks. And that's true. Some will use both. They'll, some will use remote Mac Phi in some areas and they'll use remote Phi in others. We are aware of some operators that began their DA deployments using RPDs but expect to transition to RMDs or the remote Mac Phi devices as product availability and maturity improves. So that, that remains to be seen. Uh, bandwidth for DAA node aggregation expected increase. As operators roll out more DAA nodes and move to digital forward and return, we expect them to also move to higher speed links for the aggregation and transport of data traffic from these nodes. So you've got to have more bandwidth going out to the nodes. Today, nearly half of all respondents average one gig Ethernet connections to their DAA nodes, with an additional 42% averaging 10 gigs. 6% of operators say they average 25 gigs. By 2025, 54% of respondents expect to average 10 gigs. Uh, to their DAA nodes, uh, followed by 32% averaging 25 gigs, and only 4% of respondents expect to average 1 gig Ethernet, meaning that 20 of the 50 respondents expect to transition away from 1 gig Ethernet as their average connection speed. And I don't know how reducing the service groups would impact that, because they're also trying to reduce the number of people in a service group that would be connected to a node, I believe, so I'm not sure how that impacts that. So again, you just see visually here that uh, those that are doing one gig are going to go from 50% down to very few. And then you've got um, these here in the 25 gig is we're going to be seeing a big increase there as well as in the 10 gig. There's an increase there. All respondents expect to move to a virtual CMTS. And here's where, um, you know, I think as people answer these surveys, you know, unless somebody is clarifying with them on the phone, a lot, of, a lot of them may not understand, you know, virtual CMTS and exactly what that is. So they, when they saw that everybody was saying they were moving to it, that surprised them. And they kind of drilled in a little bit. And you can see here that a lot of people didn't really understand what that was. So it says it's somewhat surprising. 
In a somewhat set of surprising results, all operator respondents said they've already deployed or plan to deploy a virtual CMTS platform within the next 24 months. So that was surprising. Um, and this is what they were saying here. So when do you expect to deploy a virtual CMTS? Again, 42% said they already had, and that was surprising. And these are, these are larger operators, 50 operators around the world, mostly in North America and then followed by Europe, I think. Um, but that's still a high number, so you wouldn't expect that. And again, 28% expecting to do it in 6 to 12 months. That was surprising. Uh, in 13 to 18 months, and then 19 to 24 months. So everybody within, they were saying, two years was expecting to do VCMTS, virtual CMTS. So because of the surprising results generated by this particular question, we decided to follow up with the 15 respondents who said they'll be using a VCMTS platform within 13 to 24 months. So that would be these these two here, I guess that's 30%. Yeah. So 15 of the respondents. Uh, we focused on this, is that right? Uh, 13, within 13 to 24 months. Yeah, there's 13, 18, 19 to 24. So that's those two colors. Yeah. Okay. Um, so in a series of prompted responses, we asked the 15 respondents to provide their definition of a VCMTS platform. And we provided a prompted list of VCMTS platform options, including, so they said a remote Phi device connected to a legacy CMTS for DOCSIS Mac processing. So that's basically DAA, Distributed Access Architecture, and it's remote Phi. Or a remote Phi device connected to a virtual CMTS defined as a software-based virtual CMTS running on a server. That would be VCMTS. Uh, a remote MacFi device, again, that's just a, a smaller CMTS out in the field. That's not a virtual CMTS. It's just a smaller piece of uh, CMTS hardware out in the field. Uh, analog nodes pulling RF signals back to cable combining equipment. That's served by a remote Phi shelf connected to servers running VCMTS software. I guess that's, I guess that's VCMTS. A vCore card and a legacy CMTS served by a remote Phi device or other, which was left open for a written response. So 73% of the respondents, 11 to 15, said that they define a VCMTS as a remote Phi device connected to a virtual CMTS. Okay, so that's most of my think getting that right. Then 20%, uh, 3 of 15, define a VCMTS as a remote Mac Phi device, and that's that's not a VCMTS. So, um, and then one respondent defined a VCMTS as a remote Phi device connected to a legacy CMTS. Uh, so yeah, so that's remote phi and this is remote vac phi. So you can see four of the 15 didn't really have an understanding of that. Um, so there's a lot more here on virtual CMTS plans. I'm just gonna cover a couple more things here. So HubSite consolidation and DOCSIS 3.1 high splits lead to VCMTS technical drivers. So as, in other words, the service providers kind of consolidate uh, their architecture and you know, try to make the most out of DOCSIS 3.1 with high splits, for example, that's leading to things that would drive virtual CMTS decisions. Um, so 78% of respondents said that hub site consolidation was a strong technical driver behind migration to a VCMTS platform, while 70% said that DOCSIS 3.1 high split upgrading was a strong driver. Cable operators have been looking to reduce the number of hub sites and secondary head ends in their network to reduce overall real estate costs and simplify and flatten their network. So they're trying to get, instead of having lots of hub sites, you know, have, have everything kind of centralized. By moving to a distributed access architecture using a VCMTS platform located in a consolidated head end or data center, combined with remote Phi nodes, cable operators can move control and data plane processing away from the hub sites and secondary head ends in which traditional CMTS and CCAP platforms have typically been located. So kind of the, the centralized head end um, as we as we've known it is going away but it's more, turning more into a vcmts along these lines 52 percent of respondents mentioned that head-end consolidation was a strong driver for migrating to a vcmts platform you see there here there's some different uh you know when you if you download this you can see the different responses there docs of 3.1 high split upgrade projects are already underway or are planned at dozens of major operators in the north american and western european markets and again this is to increase the amount of spectrum available for both the upstream and the downstream so they can increase speeds of subscribers. These projects, which extend the upstream split from 42 to 204, add significant 
upstream capacity to better compete with their fiber operator competitors, uh, symmetric service offerings. In conjunction with the transition to high split, many operators are upgrading their amplifier, amplifiers to support up to 1.2 gigahertz of the spectrum, which adds more available capacity. To reap the full benefits of these upgrades, operators are swapping out their leg legacy HFC nodes with remote PHY devices to improve MERs and signal to noise ratio. In some cases, Operators are adding in RPDs and existing amplifier stations and reducing their total amplifier numbers and network architectures from node plus five to node plus four. With the VCMTS platform in place, operators can quickly add new RPDs without having to worry about scaling service groups and or capacity per service group. So again, that's taking the, the normal CMTS that you would have in the head end on a big piece of traditional hardware and having that instead be software that's running on server a server or servers really uh, and again that can be that can be much more centralized even sitting in uh, a cloud um, i've got some expected cost savings here uh, different some more information about vcmts i didn't you know i wasn't completely confident that the people who are answering the questions knew what it was as we saw so i'm uh, just gonna one more two more things i want to mention here i'm gonna go scroll through this um, Let's see, respondents planning to work with a cloud service provider. So again, you could, you know, uh, they can take a lot of this infrastructure as they look at um, virtualizing the equipment and software defined networking, and they can move the, a lot of what they do by separating the control plane, they can move a lot of the management of stuff into a cloud service provider. Uh, so you've got here, we ask operators whether they're considering using a cloud service provider partner for hosting their VCMTS data plane and or control plane workloads. Um, out of 50 operator respondents, only two said they currently have no plans to partner with a cloud provider. Again, how many really understood the question, but probably a, a majority of them, but uh, are you considering using a cloud service provider partner for hosting your VCMTS data plane and or control plane workloads? And I didn't know you could actually do the control plane. That was a surprise. Um, so yes, data plane workloads only, excuse me, the control, the data plane. I thought that had to be out in the field. So the control plane, uh, Let's see, data plane, sorry, 32%, uh, control plane, 18%, and both data plane and control plane, 48%. Then 4% said they're not considering using a cloud service provider partner. Uh, now, we've, or it says we found these results interesting as we did not expect such a high percentage of operators to be considering working with cloud pro service providers. We expected a more even split between those that chose partnering and those that did not. Um, and then which would they work with? A lot of people know Amazon, so that 81% said Amazon Web Services, and there's Microsoft Azure, uh, Google Cloud Platform, and Alibaba, 17% there. Respondents planning to evolve to FMA, that's the flexible Mac architecture. And again, that's very closely related to distributed access architecture, but it's a, uh, it's a specific, um, specifically defined by Cable Labs, uh, the FMA kind of standard. So, um, and that's, it's basically, it's like distributed access architecture with more wrapped around it, including the, I think the software defined networking. So um, what we have here, we say, that's when do you expect it to begin deploying Doxis controller, SDN controller, Mac manager, or packet cable aggregator solution as part of a flexible Mac architecture. And you've got uh, six to 12 months, uh, not too many, 4%, 13 to 18 months, 26%, 19 to 24, 22%, and then more than 24 months, 32%, 16% say no plans to deploy, at least as of this time. 52% of respondents said they would deploy one of the FMA components with the next, within the next two years, 16% said they had no plans, as we saw right there. So, uh, And there's some techno technical decisions on migrating to flexible Mac architecture, and that's pretty much it. Um, and again, just who this, who answered. So the regional description of respondents for the survey was 40% from North America, 34% from Western Europe, 20% from the Caribbean and Latin America, and 6% from Asia Pacific. Uh, again, we saw the types of people these were, uh, as far as the decision makers and the executives, but that's the, that's the breakdown as far as, uh, where they're from. So you see here, North America and Western Europe was a big portion of that. So. Again, I think these are going to be mostly larger operators that answer this. Uh, I would think certainly, um, you know, regional kinds of operators as opposed to small independent operators, maybe in a single town.
that we're mostly answering this this survey. So uh, anyway, I will again. I've actually already posted. If you look in the uh, description of the YouTube video, you'll see that I posted a link where you can download that. I thought that was interesting. It does provide some insight on where cable operators are going in the future to try to compete with fiber. And really it's to try to get the most, to squeeze the most that they can out of their HFC plant, because they all will be migrating to fiber at some point. As I mentioned, there are several operators right now that are already doing that. Certainly, I think almost all of them are doing it in a greenfield opportunity. So if they're going to go into a new area, they're tending to go fiber to the premise there because they don't have any HFC plant that they need to rip out. They can just go all the way fiber and they're already going fiber in a lot of their plant in other places. So they're just making the choice. Let's go fiber here. But there are some that are actually overbuilding uh, their HFC plant in areas as they choose. And then you're going to see more and more of that over the years. But for right now, cable operators, in order to preserve the investment they, that they have, they can uh, much more economically upgrade their plant doing things like these node splits, the mid and high splits, um, the... Uh, distributed access architecture to try to get the most out of their cable plant. And that's the direction that the majority are going to be going here for the next 10 to 15 years. But uh, over time, you'll start to see them more and more starting to go fiber to the premise as they have to continue to compete with fiber operators. And it's going to be, you know, fiber is more reliable, uh, less maintenance. So it's going to be better for them in the long run, but it's just a really heavy cost if they've got a, a big investment in HFC that they have to pull out. So that's the reason that they're, they're going this route. But this is, I think, provides a good look into what they're doing and planning on in the future. So thanks for joining me. Uh, if you're not subscribed, click the subscribe button, ring the little bell to be notified when I'm live. I'm live every Tuesday at three o'clock, if at all possible, for Tech Tuesday. And I'm live during the day, at some point during the day, most other days, for broadband deployment news. So if you're not subscribed, click the subscribe button. As I mentioned, click the bell to be notified. If you like this, go ahead and give it a like on the video. I'd appreciate that. So thank you, and I will see you next time. I'll see you tomorrow for Broadband Deployment News. Take care. Bye-bye.